I'm going to call this um, open hearing on the security clearance reform to order, and I welcome to today's executive branch witnesses. It's good to see all of you again. Apologies for starting a little bit late. Um, it was not any of the other uh, reported intrigues that are going on. It was simply uh, uh, the vote got started a little bit late. So um, we will we will get at it. Our our witnesses today are the Honorable Melancy Harris, uh, Acting Under Secretary of Defense. Um, for Intelligence and Security, Mr. David Catler, Director of the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency, DCSA, the Honorable Dr. Rada Plum, Chief of Digital and Artificial Intelligence at DOD, the Honorable Stacey Dixon, Principal Deputy Director, uh, National Intelligence, PBDNI, representing DNI as the government's uh, security executive agency. Today, the committee will get a status update on efforts to improve how the government conducts security clearances for our national security workforce. As many of you know, we have long prioritized the need for fundamental reforms in this area. That's because we need intelligence community, community personnel and others who hold security clearances to be vetted effectively and expeditiously to ensure classified information is properly protected. We also need to balance this with the IC's agency's urgent need to quickly bring on board the very best people needed to staff sensitive positions. And that's obviously increasingly important in the challenging world. Now, when I first got involved in this, and, and uh, it may have been um, somebody who used to work on this committee staff, John Rosenwasser's fault, um, and a series of folks who came to me from the uh, the consulting industry in Virginia, um, I didn't think that I'd be a decade in. It's been almost a decade since we started this. Uh, I knew it would take some time, uh, but I did not realize this pursuit would be a career path. But the truth is the need for reform was clear. Our legacy vetting system was anchored in a system that was set up literally in 1940s and 1950s. Um, Usually with the workforce at that point, that once they got cleared, they were there for life. Um, very little mobility between agencies or with the private sector. And it focused on periodic time-based reinvestigations that was almost done all by paper and in person. And that meant that people waited way too long to get clearances, and it frankly allowed a lot of mistakes to happen. Then in 2014, OPM data breach highlighted the system structural failures, and it nearly collapsed. The backlog um, for investigation swelled to, I think, my number here is 725. My memory's got as high as 750,000. Stuck in limbo. And um, at that point, to get a top secret clearance, on average, about two years. That's crazy. Today, with nudging from Congress and, frankly, bipartisan nudging from this committee, the backlog has been significantly reduced to a steady state of about 200,000. However, however, and that's the good news, but over the last nine months, we've seen what literally is a disaster unfold with the National Background Investigation Systems, INVIS, which is supposed to deliver the IT backbone for the government's trusted workforce, workforce 2.0. The way forward, which frankly, if we don't get INVIS right, the whole security clearance reform process crumbles. Um, men amongst the and I know we've got mostly folks who follow this stuff, but there may be some that INVIS doesn't roll quite off their tongues regularly. But INVIS is supposed to enable key components such as continuous vetting. We've moved from episodic every five-year vetting to what's using technology, a continuous vetting process, so both better process, but it doesn't require the kind of effort that every five year with, with um, uh, all the staffing required. And we're supposed to recognize we've got to have more workforce mobility, we've got to realize there's got to be re reciprocity between uh, security clearance at one agency and another. Um, and again, INBIS was supposed to be the linchpin of this whole transformation. When the committee last heard a hearing on security clearance reform in March 2023, we were told, and other than Stacy, I think most of the rest of you were, were not involved at that point, we were told that INBIS was making great process in meeting developmental milestones. Since then, We've learned that INBIS has been plagued with problems stemming from poor leadership, poor executive branch oversight, a lack of clarity about requirements, and questionable contract and program management. And to just kind of drive this home, INBIS was supposed to be delivered in 2019. We're 2014 at this point, and unfortunately, with 
with not a lot of clarity in sight. Um, this is not the only place where big software development projects have run afoul. I think all of the senators up here have dealt with them, students and parents over the last year who've had to do the updated FAFSA system in terms of financial student aid. It's been a disaster in terms of the rollout. We've seen problems oftentimes with our veterans health care systems. But what we're going to, at least one of the items we're going to talk about today, um, meets the level of, of inefficiency of any of these prior screw-ups. So, Envis was supposedly, just to give you a data point, Envis was supposedly um, be completed by 2019 at an estimated cost of 700 million bucks. Yet five years later, we are not fully operational. $850 million has been spent on Invis. In addition, we just got this updated from GAO today, another 850 million on trying to deal with some of the legacy systems. And while there is a plan um, that we will actually get this completed over the next 18 months, which will put us, you know, late 2025, calendar year 2025, it's still uncertain what the balance of getting this done will cost. I know getting these new systems right is hard, but it shouldn't be this hard. Uh, the truth is, this kind of uh, screw up and this kind of inefficiency is what robs so many of our citizens of their trust in government. Now. Let me add, and again, I know there's a 90-day review that's been done. I'd like all of our witnesses to tell us about, you know, what happened during that review and what we're doing on a going forward basis. And today, we're going to need some firm commitments about when we're going to see the delivery of those capabilities. And that, again, Mr. Catler, you know, the DISA customers have been waiting for, literally for years. Um, we've got to get this right. Uh, we've got to make sure that that the good men and women who want to join the IC are not put off by the normal time, enormous time it takes to get a clearance. Uh, we also have got to get the whole implementation. I think we're at roughly 1.5 on our trusted workforce. We've got to get it to 2.0. We've got to make sure the continuous vetting, workforce mobility, clearance uh, reciprocity, and timetables are met. Um, I also want to add in my questions a little bit of an update on commercial SCIFs, which is something that I think post post-COVID uh, that we need to see. Um, I apologize again for the length of my opening, um, but it's really important issue, and I'm grateful for you all being here, and I turn it over to the Vice Chairman. Thank, thank you, and thank you to the witnesses for being here. Um, this, last year we held a hearing on this topic, and I stated at that time that the clearance process and the ongoing reforms are at the fundamental core of protecting our security and our nation's most sensitive assets, our capabilities and information. And, you know, it's the job of this committee to ensure that our intelligence is secure, at least from that's our job from a congressional oversight perspective. And so it's with serious concern that we're back here a year later in what I believe is a position worse off than we were a year ago. And I'm hoping that I, I hear from testimony today that that's not the case. We had the 2014 uh, Chinese hack into the Office of Personnel Management, the Next Generation Security Clearance IT System, the National Background Investigation Service, was expected to be online by 2019. It's now 2024. We don't have full NBIS utilization, no termination of expensive and old legacy security clearance systems, and already at the tune of more than a billion dollars per year. And look, I recognize these IT systems require upgrades, but in this case, with all this expensive security clearance legacy system still online, we have no timeline for full utilization being finalized, and an opt-in or opt-out confusing option for any federal department or agency. And so I want to be persuaded why this isn't waste and redundancy and a serious lack of ownership and accountability. Um, so I go sort of end where we began, and that is our, our oversight responsibility as a committee is to protect our nation, to make sure that our nation's most sensitive secrets are being protected while at the same time enhancing our workforce. So we've got to be able to protect our secrets and make sure the people that we're bringing in are properly vetted, but we also have to be able to bring in the best people we possibly can into the workforce. And it's essential, these efforts, that the timely and secure means of recruiting, onboarding, and retaining cleared personnel exists. And so I'm, I'm hoping that I can hear something today that makes me feel better about what I, everything I've just said, because when I compare where we are today to where we are a year ago, I think it's gotten worse, not better. So thank you for coming.
And again, for my colleagues, you know, open hearing the committee's process as we do five minute rounds in by order of seniority. With that, Secretary Harris, I think you're gonna get us started. Thank you. I'm not sure it's still working, but why don't you, you know, shout. <laughs> ask everybody to do three minutes. I'm not sure, and I feel bad for, I think we've probably got a lot of interns here that I'm not sure they can hear a word of what's being said. Do any of your mics work? Yeah. 
they could sit here. Pardon me? They could sit here. Yep. Why? Don't, you know. Testing, testing. Please work. Sounds like we need to fix the mics before we fix the clearing system. The, the clearance system. This will be a this will be a little unorthodox, <laughs> but um, I think it would be important for the people actually hear what we're saying, uh, what you're saying, and or, or, well, if we're then going to do questioning, you know, so why don't we? Why don't you all go up over over here? Is that all right? And um, um, I would ask you because we've got lots of questions, and um, so. I would urge everybody to please stick to the three minutes that we were promised on your openings. All right, just to make clear for all of those who are interested, um, this is not an intelligence failure. Uh, it is not DISA, it is not INBUS. The Senate Recording Studio owns the microphones and something, I guess, right before the hearing started fried. That doesn't mean that the Chinese are not culpable, but uh, we don't have direct proof on that yet. Until proven otherwise. <laughs> Until <laughs> I think, Mr. Cattler, you're up next. Right. Chairman Warner, Vice Chairman Rubio, and distinguished members of the committee, I'm honored and grateful for the privilege to testify before you today. Thank you for the attention you're giving to Trusted Workforce 2.0 and to the National Background Investigation Services Program. I will act with the same urgency to ensure that DCSA is responsible and accountable in both what we say and what we deliver. DCSA provides integrated security services that protect America's trusted workforce and cleared workspaces. We are the federal government's largest investigative service provider and provide vetting services for 95% of the federal government. Last year, DCSA's personnel security team conducted 2.7 million investigations, 668,000 adjudications, and performed the continuous vetting of over 3.8 million people in the trusted workforce. DCSA is also the primary implementer of the Trusted Workforce 2.0 initiative. Our INBIS program supports this reform effort as a federal IT system for end-to-end -end personnel vetting. We have faced challenges delivering INBIS to meet the expected timelines for Trusted Workforce 2.0 implementation. NBIS is unacceptably delayed and has cost far more than anticipated. Internal and external assessments of the NBIS program identified key problems across a variety of aspects, including oversight, program management, software development methodologies, acquisition strategy, team competencies, and leadership. As Undersecretary Harris indicated, the department's 90-day sprint effort has focused efforts on understanding and addressing these issues. One of the outcomes of this effort is an initial 18-month capability roadmap for NBIS development. It addresses the Trusted Workforce 2.0 technical requirements and also secures requirement alignment across the DOD. We have a plan, but we are not yet recovered. Our plan is not yet approved by our DOD Acquisition Decision Authority, and once approved, we will need time to execute the plan. To be clear, NBIS development then will extend beyond the next 18 months, but I'm confident in this path to reset the program and, and, and also in DCSA's internal actions to support NBIS recovery and to improve our visibility and management of the program itself. Also, as Undersecretary Harris noted, DCSA has onboarded new NBIS leadership to develop and implement this new roadmap. This leadership team has also evaluated and aligned a disciplined contracting strategy to support this way forward. We will obtain a new independent cost estimate to assist with developing a reliable funding profile for the program. In the meantime, we are committed to funding additional NBIS development without passing the costs on to our customers. We are working with our DOD partners and with OMB on funding options. We continue to engage customers and partners to ensure their feedback is incorporated as we implement this new roadmap. We will continue to address the GAO recommendations as well. I have also directed our DCSA Inspector General to audit the NBIS program to ensure internal accountability for both the past and moving forward. We will move forward at a responsible pace to ensure that we understand the problems and are addressing them. So in conclusion, we will move forward with a program that instills confidence, a program that delivers and upholds this mission without fail. We've embraced collaboration with our oversight partners and with our mission owners. Together, we will put ENVIS on a sustainable pathway forward to ensure a trusted workforce, to protect the nation and secure the public's trust. I'm confident in our path forward and do expect to be held accountable for our performance. Thank you. Dr. Plum will now testify to DDS's focus on modular data architecture, building the right teams, 
and adopting digital transformation best practices. Uh, Chairman Warner, Vice Chairman Rubio, and distinguished members of the committee, appreciate the opportunity to testify here before you today on the Chief Digital and Artificial Intelligence Officer role in the NBIS recovery efforts. Um, our G CDAO team has partnered with our colleagues across the Department of Defense through a 90-day discovery sprint. We focused on characterizing the problem space, user needs, as well as mission and technical requirements. We then worked with partners across DOD to ensure any proposed technology changes aligned to the full set of requirements for NBIS. As we've seen in other enterprise level implementation issues with across DOD, with analogous examples in the private industry, modernizing and scaling a technical capability requires both change in the underlying technology and a change in mindset and culture. The CDAO has made a number of specific recommendations to DCSA related to the technical NBIS solution, which can be grouped in three big areas. The first group relates to technical approach to delivering a modular data architecture. The second group focuses on building the right teams and aligning those teams on products rather than features and capabilities. And the third area focuses on adopting digital transformation best practices. The overall techn technical approach we recommend is to build upon the existing systems where possible and build the digital solutions needed in, a tar in targeted areas where needed. This combined with the expansion of technical talent and the adoption of agile software development methodologies provides a robust framework for success. I'll close by noting that in addition to the shift in technical approach, we need a mindset shift. Unlike hardware procurement, software delivery never reaches a discrete endpoint for both the front and back end system development. We should anticipate needing to devote time and resources to continuous development cycles that will maintain and continuously improve the technology. Thank you, and I'll now forward uh, turn over to Honorable Stacey Dixon to discuss the implementation of the Trusted Workforce 2.0. Chairman Warner, Vice Chairman Rubio, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss personal vetting reform. I am pleased to represent the Director of National Intelligence of Real Haynes, who serves as the Security Executive Agent for the federal government. In this role and as head of the intelligence community, she develops and oversees policies and standards for determining an individual's eligibility for access to classified information and to occupy a national security or sensitive position. Trusted Workforce 2.0 helps us ensure vetting processes are effective, timely, fair, and secure. It is centered around a risk-based model that leverages modern IT, improves timeliness, reduces complexity, and eliminates re repetitive and, du and duplicative in investigative actions. Doing so improves the mobility of the workforce to respond to mission needs and helps us direct and detect, detect mit and mitigate risk earlier. We've established a more consistent vetting foundation by creating guidelines and standards that identify intended outcomes for personnel vetting. Despite many achievements, much work remains. Implementing the most aggressive security clearance reform in decades takes time. The Honorable Harris, the other PAC principals, OMB and OPM, and I work diligently to address clearance reform challenges in an intentional way, taking into account views from multiple partners to include Congress. We acknowledge there are still areas where we must together plan for how best to achieve success. Reciprocity and the broader transfer of trust is one such area. The security portion of reci reciprocal determinations continues to improve with most agencies completing that determination within five days. Nevertheless, other transfers of trust take more time as one would expect. Factors such as polygraph requirements, medical evaluations, new continuous vetting alerts, or new jobs, the new job requiring different kinds of access to sensitive in information may also increase the time it takes to move individuals from one agency to another. There's also an increased demand for expanded transparency between agencies related to personnel mobility. To address this challenge, we're developing software that will provide greater visibility for the gaining agency so they have direct access to information they need to make transfer of trust determinations. Measuring the success of Trusted Workforce 2.0 is also important. Therefore, we're working to create a more automated solution to assist agencies in reporting their metrics. In closing, we believe it is imperative we stay focused on improving and completing implementation of the Trusted Workforce 2.0 transformation. The success of this personnel vetting reform effort will continue to require strong senior leadership commitment as well as congressional support. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. We look forward to your questions. All right, Senator Rounds, what do you got to say for yourself? <laughs> no, 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 you're not up on the panel. So, all right, so the mics are working again, and I'm going to have you all take your place cards, and I'm going to give a little, you know, there's some really tough questions need to be asked. 
You guys go ahead. I'm going to give the and, and let me, you know, kind of set the stage because, um, you know, this is a a screw up of a royal proportion. But let me make clear: while you know, Deputy Director Dixon has been on the PAC, the Oversight Board, she was not directly responsible for um, you know some of the, 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 the details of some of this, though I will ask why the PAC didn't catch it. Dr. Plum has been brought in as one of the experts to help us figure it out. And you know, Mr. Cattler and Secretary Harris are, you know, were not there when the, the screw-ups took place. Um, uh, so while I'm going to be very tough on them, you know, my hope is that that will be, we can get some answers, but I want to um, make clear that uh, for the most part, these were not the individuals, unfortunately, uh, that were um, uh, that were directly responsible. And I will, will, will add as well, some of the people who were responsible have almost all left the government, and they got quite an earful from me uh, in the interim. And let, just to put this in, in, again, in a little bit of context, you know, March of 23, we do our normal update. We're trying to figure out reciprocity is a huge issue. You, you get a clearance at security on, on DOE or, or, or DHS was one of them. Even if you got a security clearance at DHS and you wanted to move from a contract from one DHS contract to another, you still had to go through another process. It was screwy. I remember um, Dan Coates, uh, who was on this committee for many years when he became ODNI, had to go through what took to be a much longer process than it should, having him had access to all of the, uh, the information from this committee. Um, so we've been working this process, trying to drive the, the, the wait time down, trying to make sure that a clearance wouldn't have to be redone all the time. And you know, to try to do this where we have continuous vetting, using technology, not sending retired FBI agents out you know, to check whether somebody's, they actually went to college X, you know, makes sense and, and should bring about a, a more efficient system. But as we said, for a program that was supposed to be done by 2019, and you can go ahead and start the clock. I'm not going to go forever on this. Um, uh, you know, this was supposed to be in 2019. In 2023, we were led to believe that things were, were going along even though there had been delays. The amazing thing was, in September of 23, at INVIS, there was a sudden deletion of 90 terabytes of information. That's a lot of information. Now, luckily, there were some backups that were able to re restore that. But we asked, if they hadn't had that holy heck moment, would this committee have ever been informed of how screwed up things were? And to give a, a framework, um, at DCSA, 5,400 employees, roughly about 1,000 of them, almost all the time, were working on this project. The outside contractor had 1,000 plus people working on, on it. The contractor was, my understanding, was developing a program that would have never scaled to meet the needs. How did this go on without anybody saying, of a few thousand people, contractors and government employees saying, this isn't going to work? Now, some of this is due to fixed price contracts where I don't believe we've actually set the incentives in the right place to get a pr product that's deliverable. But it still begs the question of, my gosh, if there hadn't been the misplacement of 90 terabytes of data, would we have, when would we have been informed? Starting in about November, December, we had a series of, of um, meetings I did and others with uh, former Secretary Moultrie on these issues. And there was, and it went from one story to another getting worse and worse and worse. So we've not only wasted, and we don't know, for a project that was supposed to co cost in total an initial estimate $700 million, and we're at a a billion seven now, and we don't even know how much to finish. You know, for you guys who thought ACA rollout was bad, this may get close in terms of cost overruns. Um, we we need to know what the the um, 
the expectation would be. I'm going to ask, start with Secretary Harrison and, and David Yu to give us an update, and I appreciate the 90 day sprint. Um, and then I am going to ask Stacy, like, or Dr. Dr. Dixon, you know, why didn't the PAC catch this? And how do we have confidence? I mean, we can bring you guys in on a regular basis, but how are we going to have confidence this doesn't happen again? Because at the end of the day, as, as Senator Rubio said, you know, we got to guard our nation's secrets, and if we can't get people cleared, and we can't, people won't come to work for the IC, and we can't get them to move if, from our contractor community, if we can't get folks to move from one contract to another, we're not going to be as efficient as she would, we should be. So, Ms. Harrison and Mr. Catler, if you could talk, and then Ms. Dixon, if you could um, uh, answer. Thank you for the question. So first and foremost, we are, we are focused on doing this once. <laughs> so this, this sprint effort has been focused on diagnosing what has, been, what has gone on with the program and focused on moving out on an implementation plan that, that leads to success. That includes, as I mentioned, new oversight authority, both for the sponsorship of the program and for the, uh, ac the acquisition. So that will both happen at the undersecretary level in the Pentagon. This is a cross-functional effort. DCSA needs the full team at its back. So we are also working on clarity on requirements and a new requirements management process. That will be in, in conjunction with our partners in the PAC to ensure that we understand what the system needs to deliver, how our customers are using it, and what needs to be integrated into the roadmap for future development. We are also working on, as you referenced, this roadmap for delivery. So we have some predictability so we can measure how we are doing against those goals and that we can better, better mark where we have delays or other technical problems that are, are interrupting the development cycle. And finally, we are working to develop a reliable funding profile aligned to that new roadmap. As David alluded to in his statement, we are, we are conscious that we need to, as the department, take the costs of this delay and, and fund those internally. We are working through that in our current program budget review, but we are confident that we can continue to deliver this program um, if we align to these goals. Well, I would like brief answers because I'm chasing away my colleagues because we're going, but I'm going to be here as long as it takes. So I've got lots of rounds of additional questions, but, you know, and I appreciate uh, Mr. Calvary, you coming into taking taking this on because it, it was a it's a mess, and appreciate that. And but if you could briefly, and then uh, Secretary Dixon or Director Dixon, could you briefly? Because I want to make sure everybody gets a bite. Say something. I'm going to save you for my second round, so you get a reprieve. But I want to make sure, you know, um, how do we make sure that we've actually got a plan? And please give as much specificity as possible, but briefly, and I'll. I have lots of follow-ups for later. Well, thank you, Chairman. Um, I just reinforce what the Acting Undersecretary said first by saying that I'm, I joined literally a week before that 90-day period began for the review and was able to then plug into that fully, and I'm confident that we brought the right people to bear to take a hard look at this. From my perspective, we considered uh, personnel, personal expertise as a first basket. We looked at procurement as a second, and we looked at oversight as a third. And we've both made many points uh, already, but happy to amplify on what the specifics were that we went through as we did that review. Um, but moving forward, we have new oversight authorities. We will have clarity on program requirements and new requirements management process. And I think it's important to say here that the trusted workforce requirements, as well as those of ENVIS as initially conceived, are understood and sound. I think the problem really was their interpretation and making sure that my agency had what it needed in terms of its knowledge and capability to actually deliver properly on those requirements. This was a large part of this discovery process as we went through it. Uh, we will also have an updated and, uh, and good vetting capability roadmap for delivery and, and a reliable funding profile aligned to that new roadmap. And after its approval, we will also get that outside independent cost estimate to be even more confident in compliance than with policy and statute. We show you the right documents. So at the end of this 90 days, we will deliver, have delivered, an updated set of acquisition documents, this revamp requirements, governance procedures, agile training and documentation. Uh, as Dr. Plum has also said, we've brought in some new people. We know where our gaps are and the skill sets that we need to hire on the government side. We're working with the contractor as well on actions need to be taken there. And we are also evaluating the requirements baseline. So I, I have a lot to say on this point, but again, in the interest of time, I'll stop. Yeah, well, you know, I'll come back around. Senator Rubio. Um, 
So this could be to Director Dixon or Secretary Harris or both. Um, the continuous vetting in the National Background Investigation Service is not mandatory for all the agencies um, and departments to use as their system under the Counterintelligence Security Agency. And this directly I think, impacts oversight by ODNI as a security executive agent. Um, Additionally, contractors have a real tough time being able to plan and train to these very different systems. And it's not easy to track whom to contact for security clearance tracking and reciprocity. So the DCSA and NBIS systems of security clearance do not cover um, or support the IC. Why is that? And what, what is the plan going forward? In particular, what about reciprocity for employees that are moving, for example, from CIA to DIA? I will take that one, sir. The, the, you're absolutely right that DCSA does not cover the intelligence community. We have a number of agencies within our community, and we essentially allow them to determine the types of risks that they're willing to take as they're bringing on board their folks. So they don't do their own. Many of them do their own uh, investigative service. They also have enhanced, enhanced vetting processes that they include to include polygraphs, medical, um, some psychological screenings that DCSA does not provide. But those are what they believe they need to bring on board the kinds of folks that they need for their particular workforce. To expect DCA to, DCSA to do that sort of tailoring for different agencies to deliver what they need is something that we wouldn't put on them. We believe that the agencies themselves are best positioned to bring their folks on and know what kinds of vetting they actually need to do. Uh, we are very comfortable with what DCSA does, does with the rest of the government, but with respect to the intelligence community, because it is so variable between the agencies, it's better for them to be able to, uh, to actually pick their process. So what are, which agencies don't use NBIS and DCSA's CV program? Which are the agencies that do not? We have a, a within, within Within, uh, within C the CV particular, continuous yes. vetting is done by everyone. Right. It's just done differently. We have a continuous evaluation system that we use within the intelligence community, but it uses many of the same uh, reports and, and uh, data sources that the CV does, is uses for DCSA. So there's commonalities there. It is just a different system that we run. David, do you want to? Uh, yes, thanks. I just add from the DCSA perspective, we're managing enrollment and alert resolution for 3.8 million Department of Defense, military, civilian, and national industrial security program contractors, but also for 44 non-DOD federal agencies. So it's a, it's a very large population that we're handling outside the IC. So is not having a sort of a single or at least a, as a baseline, a single NBIS-like system for the federal government, doesn't that hamper efforts at reform and, and oversight because we're in essence dealing with all these silo type systems and, and our, our answer actually would be no sir because trusted workforce 2.0 is bringing in the standardization and the guidelines so that even though we're using different investigative processes the underlying principles behind them are the same and what will happen with a clearance the the types of security clearances that are being granted the types of of vetting that's being done is similar across the board. When it comes to the IC, we just require more than some of the other government agencies, and so we're handling that more section. So it's really the baseline and foundation is similar. It's just the extra parts are different for what our community needs. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And let me say to our panel, years ago when Senator Moran of this committee and I started on the declassification reform issue, we learned that a staffer actually had to trek around from office to office with a blue bag waiting around for approval. And I always wondered whether this took so long that the staffer had to pack a lunch because it looked like they were out there for great lengths of time. And this was because Senator Moran and I found that the different systems didn't talk to each other. So we're going to start speaking English now about exactly what is at issue. And then with digital records, they just overwhelmed this broken system. So I had a number of conversations with Director Haynes, and she said, you and Senator Moran are absolutely right. And we've got to get serious about it. She went and gave a big speech in Texas, Senator Cornyn, who's taken a great interest in it. And she said, we're going to reform it. 
So I want to ask some questions now of you, Dr. Dixon, to pick up where we left off on this kind of setting the table that I have uh, done here. And you were last in our hearing last March, and I asked then, I'm going to ask now, has any progress been made in the administration's rewrite of the executive order governing classification and declassification? The, the administration continues to make progress on that. I believe that they will have some upcoming deliverables over the course of the summer that we're all looking forward to, but it's been a very collaborative process across the interagency, making sure that everyone's equities are take, being taken into account. So you expect that we'll get that this summer? I believe that is their goal. Okay. Now, obviously, real reform means you gotta have somebody in charge. Is the administration any closer to designating an executive agent for classification and declassification? I would say part of the executive order conversations that they're having involve who that executive agent will be for declassification. So will we be close to actually getting an executive agent for classification and declassification, in your view, by fall? That's a yes or no answer. I, I'm not in charge of the process. Their goal is who, to deliver. Who is, who is? The administration itself is actually delivering the executive order update. And once they deliver that, part of that is a description of who will be the declassification executive agent. Once that is defined, they will then go about filling the process. So, so when, when do you believe we'll have an executive agent for your classification and declassification? Because that's key. You know, in other words, Senator Warner, Senator Rubio talking about all kinds of very serious things. And I think back through some of what Senator Moran and I have been through. And we so the first thing we got to do is figure out how to put this in terms people can understand. The system we found with the person in his blue bag made a mockery out of what government is supposed to be all about. I'm at the point, I'm now, I believe, the longest serving member of this committee. I think we're at the point where the classification system is so broken, we can't even necessarily figure out who the bad guys are and who the good guys are. So uh, I hope you'll take back, and I'm going to be on the phone with Director Haynes very quickly on this question of when we're going to get a executive agent for classification. In the meantime, sir, we're also, we are also making some strides to actually improve declassification. But I do believe once the EEO, the executive order is delivered, it will explain who the executive or agent is for okay. classification is. So one last uh, question. My time is short for you, Ms. Dixon. So I think it is generally believed that declassification reform is going to save taxpayers some money in the long term, but we're going to have to have some investments in order to modernize the current obsolete system. Has the ODNI arrived at some estimates for how much declassification reform will cost in the next few years, A, and B, will you make public what those estimates are? Because we have spent so much money on this, I think people have a right to know. What's the answer to that? And I guess I got eight seconds to get it under the gun. With respect to the first one, we are in the process of figuring out what tools, capabilities, incentives we need to actually put in place so that people are thinking more about what information they can declassify versus how we've been protecting it in the past. Uh, I will take back whether or not we're going to be publicizing that number. Just just know, and I'm going to say it right, right here, Senator Rubio kids me from a, we're going to have a real fight if there is a resistance to making those estimates public. We have spent so much money for so long, the public's got a right to know on where we go from here, especially given the fact that my chair has asked these serious questions and we're kind of in the dark about what's happening with the delay. So that's... And I would, you know, and Ron, Thank you know, you. We, we had, we took your bill and your and, Jerry, your and Senator Rand's bill. Senator Cornyn had a lot of work on this. We built it in. We had, we went even further, and it was all in the IAA last year, and we got it to the, it ended up not being this committee, it ended up being some of our colleagues in the House, and we've still got many of those provisions in this year's IAA, so we we are not letting go of that and appreciate the, the great work that you and Senator Moran have done, and I know Senator Cornyn's been an advocate on this as well. Senator Cornyn, you're up. Well, let me start with uh, where Senator Wyden left off, the uh, and Senator Warner, the Sensible Classification Act that we passed last year. 
Part of that required studies and recommendations on the necessity of security clearances. I believe the testimony we've heard was that there are four million people with security clearances in America. If four million people are supposed to keep the nation's secrets, it seems to me that there's a lot of not secrets being kept. I mean, that, that things are not secret. So, and we've learned that some of the FTEs require a security clearance without regard to actually the necessity of that person getting a security clearance and the like. So what I wanted to ask is, have the agencies that, you've over, that you oversee begun the studies on the necessity of security clearances, including a description of how the agencies will make sure that the number of security clearances granted will be kept to a minimum? Let me start with you, Dr. Dixon. I actually don't know the answer to that question. I will go back and find out whether the studies have begun. That concerns me. You're the deputy director of national intelligence. So you don't have that information? That particular one, no, sir. I do not. Any of the uh, rest of you have any knowledge of any um, studies that have been done or are in the process of being done as required by the statute? Okay. Well, that's kind of a... Not a great start. Let me go back and, uh, as I understand it, the Defense Counterintelligence Security Agency was established in 2018, of course. The NBIS, the uh, personal vetting system, was supposed to be the end-to-end -end -end IT infrastructure to enable the comprehensive personal vetting on a single platform. Um, and, uh, it was originally supposed to be completed by 2019. That was five years ago at a cost of $700 million. But here we are five years later, and the program's not operational, and $850 million has been spent. Can any of you tell us when this, the NBIS will become operational? So we have delivered some NBIS capability to date. Uh, at this time, as part of the 90-day effort, we are rebaselining to make sure we understand exactly. That means you're starting over? We're not starting over. As, as I think you've heard some of the other witnesses talk about, we're, we're looking to make sure that we can, can use what has been built. We are, we are exploring exactly what, what needs to happen going forward to ensure we meet the full, full level of capability that is expected from the system. There, at this time, we are in the process of refining exactly our understanding of that timeline. I commit to in other, in other words, you don't you can't tell us at this point. I cannot tell you at this point. What I can commit to is that we will keep this committee informed as those estimates take shape. Yeah. We are going through the process as I discuss, as I discussed to to work with uh, the Undersecretary for Acquisition and Sustainment. As part of that, we are rebaselining the program. We will have an independent cost estimate. All of these are things that I commit to keeping the committee informed on as this work takes shape. It couldn't happen in 90 days. This is a month-long effort, but we we are fully committed to making sure that you have the full visibility as it comes together. So you can't tell us when the uh, NBIS will be operational at this point. As I look at the, um, the new NBIS program manager and program executive officer has identified, it looks like, four main reasons why this program is overdue and over budget. Um, one was the trouble with requirements. The second is too much focus on technical debt. The third is poor contract management. And the fourth is insufficient time and criteria for review. The GAO, the General Accountability Office, has conducted multiple studies and made a variety of recommendations. Um, are those recommendations being implemented in the uh, current efforts? Senator, yes, they are. We're taking corrective action on those. That's one commitment that I make to this committee and to my agency. And is there a, who, who is in charge in the sense that there needs to be somebody held accountable, and as long as everybody's accountable, no one's accountable, who is in charge of making sure this program is back on track and will be delivered as promised? So I believe that uh, as the program sponsor, the Undersecretary for Intelligence and Security has responsibility 
as it's a shared responsibility with the Undersecretary for Acquisition and Sustainment to ensure that this program is sufficiently overseen and that we are we are doing this soundly and in line with the requirements as they have been. So the Department out. of Defense is responsible? The Department of Defense is responsible and we are fully committed to making sure that this is the path to success for NBIS as we move forward. Well, it's no surprise to me that uh, a program as complex as this is overdue and over budget when apparently the ba most basic requirements were never identified initially. Is that correct? I think the requirements were, were outlined in Trusted Workforce 2.0. I think what we had was a breakdown in how those requirements were being managed into technical requirements for the development and how we were taking account of the delays in that process. And that is something that we are seeking to remedy immediately with more proactive oversight from the Undersecretary of INS's office in partnership with DCSA as we look to make sure we put this on a sound foundation. My time is overdue. And I, just to make you feel, one, I think you can all get on Dr. Dixon on classification. The other folks who are here, it's more on security clearance reform, but to add kind of insult to injury, you know, you had a thousand people at DCSA working on this, and a thousand people at Paraton, the contractor, working on this, and why nobody raised their hand earlier is uh, something we're going to get to at some point today. Well, Mr. Senator, but, Mr. Chairman, if I could just yeah. add, the fact that there's a couple thousand people working on it doesn't mean that they know what they're doing or they're working in, in alignment toward a toward a achievable objective on a timely basis. To me, that seems like the biggest problem here is lack of lack of leadership and a lack of any accountability. And uh, I grant that they're working on it, but I don't think that's a great answer. I, yeah, no, I, well, we do have new people in because it was. I, I wish we would have done this when the prior people were here so we could, you know, appropriately scour. And again, we, I want, when we get around another round, Dr. Plum has got, because she's got a team that has been helping try to help figure this out as well. So, Senator Bennett. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate your mentioning that. Dr. Plum, that's actually where I'm headed, so. I appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, we have heard what a disaster the development of the national background investigation system has been. And it sounds like, I hope, the review team has a clear understanding of what needs to happen to get this back on track. And I look forward to regular updates on the progress. Others have covered the costs here. I want to focus on the schedule delays. GAO reported in June 2023 that 16 of the 25 major IT business programs at DOD reported cost or schedule changes since January 2021, including 12 that had cost increases ranging from 43,000 to 194 million dollars had um, scheduling delays. I think there were 12 ranging from three to 33 months. And program officials attributed to the changes to factors such as new requirements and unanticipated technical complexities that I'm sure drove sc scope in some way that uh, might have been predicted, I guess. But my question is broader than MBIS. It gets at the pattern of large-scale IT acquisition and software development across the federal government. The chairman mentioned FAFSA and our veterans' health systems, but we could list what feels like an endless, endless, endless list of, of examples. By the way, examples where people are here to do the work but never here for the accountability when we, we were doing our oversight. Um, the IRS, you know, uh, comes to mind in my in my mind actually recently as a as a decent um, implementation, but I'll put that to one side. Dr. Plum, in your statement for the record, you laid out three key points that this team will adopt: fixing the data architecture and adopting a modern approach, building a, the right team with the right skills and technical acumen, and adopting digital transformation best practices. My question is, why can't we seem to adopt these principles across the federal government, or at least in the IC and the DOD? Until these principles are mandatory, we're going to experience these failures again and again, wasting time and money and failing to deliver for the taxpayers. Would you like to say a word about that, Dr. Plum? Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, I think maybe the way to start this is, Fundamentally, our acquisition models in the U.S. government and the Department of Defense in particular have remained hardware-centric. So we fund them in similar ways to the way we fund hardware procurement, and we use feature delivery as our milestone markers for progress on them. 
companies that manage IT successfully with minimal disruption to users have a more continuous integration and continuous delivery and deployment pipeline process that, for instance, only takes software offline for very short periods of time to do upgrades and invest 70 to 80% of the total program costs into the back-end data architecture and infrastructure as compared to the front-end user interfaces and features. So inside, um, inside the, the broader question of software acquisition, while we have authorities and the software acquisition pathway, the traditional program management oversight and processes have tended to drive focus on the wrong areas. And um, that creates both a prioritization problem, where prioritization is on front end user interfaces and new features rather than back end investments and funding um, issues because those back end technical complexities cost money and take extra time. Um, in the context of NBIS, our driving our recommendations is really focusing on those back end improvements, uh, keeping what we can, building new things where we need to, and then marrying that up with an agile continuous process for software development and delivery um, so that we, we don't face these problems again in the future. And I'll just close by saying that while we, of course, want to get to the point where we're meeting the full set of the requirements, there's no point at which this is done. And I think moving to a mindset where this is a continuous development and improvement process that will continually manage and upgrade the back-end technology and front-end features is part of what can prevent and, this. Impact. And Dr. Plum, could I, with the last 30 seconds that I have, could you talk a little bit about the Defense Digital Service? And you know, is this the type of team that that we can bring in that that agencies, you know, working with either the principles that you've described or some rationale at least could help make a difference in these kind of implementations? Absolutely. Um, the Defense Digital Service um, focuses on, they serve as our chief product office inside the chief digital and AI office in the Pentagon. They um, focus on a what we call product management approach to delivery, which means they combine a product manager who owns a roadmap and that ag agile development process oversight with software engineers and user experience designers and researchers. The idea of that, what we call product trio, is to focus on turning the requirements that come in from customers into technical requirements and roadmaps, and then ensuring that there is a systematic uh, execution of those that are linked to continuous testing and user experience. And this team is one that we apply to major issues and concerns inside the department that rise to a sort of priority uh, senior leader level, like NBIS. Uh, Doctor, for your oversight of this, I, it's going to be hard to get to the bottom of all of it, and I'm grateful that you're making it a priority. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Away we go. Uh, I, I think I, I really want to focus on one particular issue to begin with, and 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 I think uh, uh, Deputy Dixon, I think. I'm going to focus with you simply because you come with DNI. What I'm curious about is we're doing our best here to identify and to be able to get folks in for security clearances and get them through. Extremely frustrating. And, it, and it's in all branches of government. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we keep these individuals and that they feel that they are appreciated and that, and that their service is meaningful and that Basically, we have their back. The reason why I lay it out that way is because most recently, for the second time now on a 60 Minutes display, we talked about um, uh, the, the AHI or the anomalous health incidences in which individual members who are well respected within your community have clearly identified health issues that they attribute to specific identifiable incidences that have occurred. Now, we've had classified briefings uh, on the topic, and I understand that this is a very sensitive area. But I think for the individuals that are outside of those meetings that we have, individuals that are within the community, I think we should publicly talk about how we are going to address their concerns, and probably to the American people that this is not something which is being 
ignored or put on the back shelf. Can you share with us, first of all, within your office, who is responsible and accountable for actually chasing down what is going on and not just simply the fact that we know that these incidences are occurring. There's a recognition of that and we respect these individuals, but there doesn't seem to be a, an attribution or a discussion of the attribution which has occurred. Could you perhaps in this open discussion at least give us some assurances that this is an ongoing thing that is gonna get followed up on? Thank you, Senator Rounds, and, and absolutely. We are, our first priority is taking care of the individuals within our community, so our employees, their family members, whoever is, being, uh, whoever is experiencing health challenges as a result of whatever the cause of the thing is. Um, we have, from the top levels of every agency, made sure that it's very clear that whatever they are experiencing should be reported, and once reported, we should do our best to get them the kind of help that they need. If that ends up being a payment out of the Havana Act, that is, that is one route that they can go, but making sure that they get the quick medical care. With respect to the side of who's actually looking for and who's going after, it's really an entire age, it's an all of IC process. So it's not just if our it is, organization. With all due respect, if it is everybody, it is nobody. Somebody's gotta be in charge. I guess that's what I'm asking is, is who's in charge of this very serious issue? It has to be, the because the information that we need to collect is collected by different agencies. Different agencies are responsible for different parts of it. The DNI has very clearly stated that it is our op there, it is our our plan to not only take care of employees, but to try to close those intelligence gaps that have kept us from being able to do the attribution that you're talking about. So the DNI at the top, okay. ODNI can be in charge. Okay, but we alone so can't do it. within the the ODNI, the mm -hmm. Office of the Director of National Intelligence, somebody has to be the person responsible for accumulating, acquiring, and pushing for this information. I don't need that name here, but is there a person who is responsible for getting this done? There are different people responsible for different parts. The part of collecting the reports from across the community, yes, there are individuals who do that. The part of making sure that the agencies are out collecting information so we can close those intelligence gaps, yes, we are overseeing that as well. So not one person doing both parts, but because one's focused on the work, the people, and the other one's focused on the adversary or whatever may be causing these things. So and there I, are individuals. And, and, and how about the technical side of this? Is there a person working on the technical side of who is using what type of a weapon system or a, 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 a technology, do we have another person responsible for chasing that down as well? The folks that are overseeing the collection side are also working with those who have the technologies. So now we're down to just two people basically that are working on this or that, that, that are accountable for putting this all together. And is somebody overseeing those two individuals or is that directly reporting to ODNI? Those are, within ODNI, we have individuals overseeing them. So those that are overseeing what's happening in the community with respect to collection, as well as what's overseeing that the guidance that we're putting forth on how to take care of our workforce is being followed. Yes, correct. So we have one person in charge of each of those two. At some point, somebody's gotta be in charge. I think if, if you were to ask my boss, Director Haynes, she would say she's in charge. She's the, the, the place where it, where it ends. And so by default, I am in charge as well. We will make sure that our communities are doing what we have provided guidance to them to do, which is to take care of the people and to do our best to close the intelligence and, gaps. And, and I don't mean to belabor this, and I'm already over my time, but it just seems to me that if, unless there isn't somebody who can look at us and tell us, this is my responsibility, I'm in charge of getting through this thing, I'm responsible for having this thing fixed. Uh, then it means that, that it's gonna be on the backside and it's gonna get delayed and we're not gonna get it completed in a timely fashion. I simply bring it to your attention because I think we're gonna have to continue to ask that question okay. until we get a, a direct answer about somebody who is responsible for following this through just to make sure that those folks out there that are suffering through this and that may be, be uh, impacted by this in the future know that it is not on the back shelf. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would say, Senator Rounds, I think you know the vast majority of folks affected were CIA, and CIA was taking the point, but there were then a f people that were affected DOD that was a, kind of a separate chain, and and then there were some Treasury. So you know there was, it was across a oh, series of no question. But but the problem is, is unless we've got somebody responsible for actually chasing this stuff down and everybody's looking at each other, yeah. we're not going to get this thing fixed. 
And it seems to me that we owe it to the intelligence community, to the folks that are actually doing the hard work outside of our boundaries, that we're gonna follow this thing through and that we have not simply said, we know something happened, we don't know what it is and we're not gonna do, and, and until we it will, comes to us, yeah, yeah. we're not gonna chase it. Well, out. we have a hearing, I think July 31st, on this topic exactly, and, and you know, again, Excellent. I think we need to get it fully aired out. And hopefully by then we'll know who the folks are that are actually chasing it down and they can share with us what they've gotten done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Kelly. Ms. Harris, uh, when, when was the initial RFP for the program and invest? When did we, when did we start? So I will refer to DCSA for the specifics on the, the contracts, but this was this has been a multi-year process that-, that Well, when, when was the contract awarded? Okay, I will defer to David for the specifics on that. The first one with the with Periton as Sen the prime. And Senator, this program was begun in 2016 as a DISA effort, so the first RFP would have been issued then. You know, a typical software program, you come up with a set of requirements, you come up with a plan on how you're gonna you know, develop the software, how you're gonna verify it, how you're gonna test it, how you're gonna um, make sure all the parts work together, make sure it's integrated with other systems. Pretty early in a program, you fix requirements. And you say, this is it. And contractor, you need to build this. You know, software acquisition often goes, you know, one of the ways it can go kind of sideways on you, is if you keep changing you know, the requirements. I heard, I can't remember who said it, maybe Dr. Plum, that you now have a new requirements management process that you're putting into, into place. So it sounds like the requirements are still being developed for this system that we started to acquire in 2016. That could be the problem. I mean, I, I have yet to hear what the real problem was that caused this to be delayed from something that started in 2016 that was supposed to be delivered in 2019 and now we're in 2024 and it sounds like we're still working on requirements. Um, let, me, let me ask one question. The other possibility, or maybe it, it's a combination of a few things, I think somebody mentioned production challenges and difficulties and requirements was thrown out there, is the contractor. You know, software is you know, it's hard. I'd say, you know, it's, diff di it's different than manufacturing hardware, obviously. It presents its own set of challenges. So are you having problems with the contractor being able to write the code and then verify the code and test the code? Or is it the thing I started with, with which you keep changing the requirements and they can never catch up? So I'll start with the requirements and then I'll defer to David on, on the specifics on the, on the engineering. I think when, when you hear us talk about the requirements process, what we have is for something like this, we're getting real-time user feedback. The, the federal customers are using it. There are things that will be need, need to be integrated into future development cycles. Right now, what we did not have was a rigorous way for us to take those requirements and kind of look at them against a technical roadmap and understand where they would, where they would affect the development timelines. And so that is a place where the Undersecretary of INS's office will be taking an active role to make sure we have a better set of processes to make sure that as we're getting feedback from users, as they're using NBIS, as the capabilities roll out, and there are requests for new and different things, we understand the the effect they may have on our long-term development timeline. Was that built into the contract that, uh, that, that you were gonna continue to feed back new requirements to them as this was tested and they, have, they would have to make changes? So I think as we are onboarding folks into this process, right, there is an expectation that as we are developing under agile methodologies that we would be getting user feedback and we'd be ingesting that into future deliveries. I think what we did not have was a really mature infrastructure to kind of translate government requirements into technical requirements as Dr. Plum mentioned. And so that's a key finding from this 90 days is we need to get more rigorous around that. The overall requirement is Trusted Workforce 2.0. The requirements for what MBIS needs to deliver that end-to-end -end IT system for vetting have been clear from the beginning. The enforcement and the kind of interaction of that with the technical development and the user feedback is where I think the rigor needs to come in. I'll defer to, to David for specifics on the, on the contractor performance. <laughs> Senator, we started with a firmly defined set of requirements. 
We had requirements first from the Secretary of Defense in 2016, as the acting undersecretary has laid out about that end-to-end -end system. Those were complemented by further requirements when the administration's agenda in that time frame, 2018, for trusted workforce came together. Those requirements, though, are essentially the same. They're just at a higher level when you combine the departmental requirements and the cross-governmental requirements. I'm going to give you a perspective from inside DCSA now mm -hmm. looking at this. What I would say is that they were realistic, the requirements, they were achievable, but my agency did not have a firm understanding of the complexity of the technical features nor how exactly to approach those and accomplish them. Now, as Dr. Plum has also said, it would seem from our review, from my review now as the director, about 100 days, that we did in fact, as Dr. Plum said, focused first on features and a bit less on functional capability delivery. And there's a related point here then about cost, about legacy system sunsetting. Because if, for example, we had taken an approach to prioritize the sunsetting of the legacy systems, and especially those that cost the most first, we could have wound up in a different financial picture at this point, if not actually had delivered more capability at an earlier time. Was the, uh, was the contractor aware of the complexity of the system? Do you think they were pretty... Um, you know, honest with you about the challenges that they were going to face? Senator, I, I think there's a couple things in there. I'd say one is, yes, I think the contractor has been honest with the government about what they can deliver, and they've done the work as the government specified it. But at the same time, the government reserved for itself the role of being the software integrator. So in that, we asked for certain things. It's, Senator, that's why I'm emphasizing the significance of my agency's decision-making about has interpreting the, has the requirements. The, has, has, did, have those individuals within the government that was going to do the software integ integration? Have they done software integration on any programs before? Yes, sir. My new NBIS program manager has deep and lengthy experience doing this for the Army for enterprise information systems. It's one of the primary reasons why I selected him to be the program manager. Mm -hmm. And could you give us an example of Periton, what else they have built? Uh, sir, in this case, all I could say now is that uh, what I rely on Periton for are these software services related to ENVIS and also mm -hmm. for a very extensive effort related to field operations for background investigations themselves. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me, let me make a, a try at this. This is my kind of understanding, and I welcome anyone on the panel to, to correct. This is a hard issue. We've been trying it for a long time. Conceptually, I think, you know, a trusted workforce 2.0 is a great goal to get to. DCSA is a relatively new entity, and we, I think they got the big picture requirements in place. But candidly, from conversations I've had with predecessors and others, DCSA did not have the technology knowledge of how complicated these requirements would be to actually build and build at scale. And one of the key things that Mr. Catler just said was, my new Imbus supervisors got this experience, which by uh, previously, they didn't have that experience. And there was a while, and, and some of the predecessors who had positions here were either they couldn't, wouldn't, or shouldn't kind of say, this is above my, my knowledge level. So you have the problem that the requirements, and you know, look at the, you know, we all see the placemat here. We've all read, seen the gazillions of these. But we're taking a system that was really antiquated and trying to come up with this new cutting edge idea, the good idea, but boy, the implementation has been really bad. To compound this, and the Paratung does a, you know, a lot of work in, in other parts of the IC, you know, I think we had a fixed price contact, contract. That's why we came up with this notion, well, it's got to be only 700 million bucks. And I worried that there was not even any incentive, because I think at some point along the way, even though they may have been I don't think DCSA got the requirements right specifically to the technical capability that need to draw it, but probably the contractor bid against an inappropriate set of requirements. But what makes me crazed a little bit is that somewhere along the way, I think even if they had 
built to the requirements that they'd opted for, they couldn't scale those anyway. And because you know, I wonder, and again, I'm, I'm anxious to be contradicted on this, is you had folks at the contract saying, well, we're on a fixed price contract. As long as we hit, hit these things, we're going to be fine, even though I think probably people had to have known, oh my gosh, what we're building can never scale to the needs of the whole classified and, and secret uh, workforce. And maybe at DCSA, you didn't have enough folks or maybe we were so far along, they kept with a hope and a prayer that this would figure itself out. And we had a holy heck moment, and we, we weren't, you know, we were pushing, we were told things were going along, and frankly, only because an inadvertent loss of nine terabytes of data that they did recover, that we even found out about this. I mean, when would we have known? I mean, at some point, you know, the, you know, the game was up because there was not going to be any plan where they would have had a fully operational system by September of 24, even a year ago. And then there was like, as the deeper we got into the rabbit hole, it was more like, holy heck, this is not a short term. This is a massive screw up. So we got 850 million bucks that we've spent so far. We got 850 million dollars of maintaining legacy systems that we wouldn't have had to spend if we would have gotten the new systems in place by 2019. I think Secretary Harris and Director Cattler are working their tail off to try to um, get us this output of what it's going to take in 18 months and how much it's going to cost. But thank goodness, and I hope this is where we've got to figure out your capabilities overall. What Dr. Plum's group is supposed to be doing is they're supposed to be the technical, as, Mike, as Senator, Kate, or Senator Benner said, you know, the technical SWAT team to come in, because I don't think you had the technical SWAT team at the at DCSA, and how we get at the contractual obligation that if the, if the contractor has got the technical knowledge, why don't they raise their hand and say, hey, this is, we're building you stuff, but by the way, we're not building you something that can scale. We got to figure out how we think about Contract and and one thing I would also say is if there are other I mean the committee wants to work with if there are other legislative authorities you need in this software management we're willing to take a good hard look at that but is the characterization of how we got here that I just laid out am I right am I partially right am I wrong who wants to, who wants to take that I mean like lots of hands going but so please. So I think at the beginning we expected we would gain coefficiencies by putting this a DCSA between mission and what mission what this is supposed to deliver. I think what we have we have realized is that this a program of this scale and complexity to exactly your point needs a whole of department approach. So I think that's what you're you're seeing reflected here today. You know, we need Director Catler's leadership, we need Dr. Plum's squad, we need Undersecretary LaPlante's acquisition oversight, we need our CIO looking at this against other software systems in the department, and we need uh, intelligence and security to make sure this meets the mission. And that is what we needed. And so I think the road you laid out, Senator, is exactly right, but I think what you need is the, the team you have right now looking at this. But wasn't that the fact that we, but if we had been smarter in 2017, 2018, shouldn't we have known that we were asking this relatively small entity to take on a task that was too big for its britches? And there were our capabilities inside of DOD that can, um, now the bug's gone from your mics to our mics. You know, there are capabilities, and that's what I think Secretary Harris is saying is, we're gonna try to bring all the capabilities of DOD to the table. We should have probably had that we probably were expecting too much from an agency that was not fully prepared to execute this. Can we get back to the Please. contract, though? So what happens now? I mean, at one point, the contractor, the prime contractor, sent an invoice for something that was beyond $700 million, right? And they had to explain themselves. I mean, what was their explanation? And then have we resolved that issue, or is, this, is the cost going to just continue to grow? Because I imagine, my guess is, because, uh, you know, I've seen this before, the contractor says, well, you're changing the requirements on me. We had a fixed price, you know, we had a fixed price contract to build this box that does these things. And now a few years later, you've got, we've deployed parts of this and you have the, the end user is saying, 
that they want changes, and you're feeding this changes back to the contract, and they say, well, we weren't contracted to, to, to do that. So then they say, well, it's going to cost you this much more. And every change order is going to be, you know, whatever, $10,000 for every single change. Has that portion of this been resolved? Well, yes, Senator, and that's why I've said my second basket of issues we looked at in this 90-day review was, in fact, procurement. And that's, you know, as I said in my statement for the record, that's everything from not just how we got here, but also to how we need to move forward. Do we have the right contract vehicles? Are we incentivizing and disincentivizing properly to hold a contractor accountable? Is the government clear in terms of what it's calling for? Do we have the right expertise? I mean, as I say, we didn't just need technical expertise on the IT. We also need to take a hard look at the procurement. I mean, to link both of your, both of your interventions, what I would say is uh, I also agree that it, it would seem to me it was a lot to put on a new agency to tackle this as well as the agency was standing up. Mm -hmm. However, there was too much authority vested in the previous incumbent in my role in this context, and that's why I wholeheartedly agree with the elevation of product ownership the program ownership up to the Undersecretary for Intel and Security, and the Acquisition Decision Milestone Authority also being elevated away from me at DCSA to the Undersecretary for Acquisition and Sustainment. Because in effect, my agency was allowed to call the shots on how to interpret the requirements, figure out what the procurement approach should be, figure out what the technical details then uh, were inherent in all that development, take the decisions about contractor performance and compliance, what information was reported out for oversight. So if I may, Senator, yeah. to, back to both of you, because you've also asked, is there anything that needs to just clarify a, a couple points um, that I think are important. First is that you've asked the question of when we would have, when you would have been notified and when you would have found out. And I think two things I would say here, just, just so at least me as the DCSA director, where I'm clear on what I communicate to you. The previous Undersecretary, Undersecretary for Intelligence and Security came before this committee in November of 2023 and did inform you that largely the program was on track. My agency did not inform the Undersecretary for Intelligence and Security and the office that we were substantially off track and would not meet the 2024 deliverable until after that hearing had concluded. So that's, that's one point I just want to make sure that, that I share with you. And the other thing I would say is which is a big freaking deal. That's it? It's a big deal that he, they, he was. Sort of it's a big deal. Him. Yes, Senator. That's why I'm making sure that I clarify that. The other thing I would say is that on your, on your observation about the OPUS outage, so this is the, the OPM, uh, one of the OPM legacy systems that we rely on, essentially a data storage system for the records. Uh, I do not think that the two things, Envis and OPUS are actually not linked in a direct causal way, meaning that the opus outage that occurred would not in itself have triggered my predecessor nor anyone else to come here and say that Envis would not be delivered on time. But I believe what happened, and you weren't there, but I believe what happened, and some of the folks who are working on this are not here now, um, they're over with Dr. Dixon, but was that we people came in and informed, well, we got this problem, we're gonna get it fixed, we've lost nine, you know, any terabytes of data, but we or we got a backup, so we're going to find it. And oh, by the way, there was not a linkage that loss was related to Invis, but oh, when in that notification around the 90 terabyte, oops, that was when we were notified by Invis. So I don't want to imply that they were linked, but it was like a they're, simultaneous they're, notification. They're, they're coincident in time, Senator. Um, but I, my my review of this, and again, I have my Inspector General helping me with this also. But my review of this. Because we did conclude the investigation into the opus outage about my first week in the role here as the director. Uh, we already knew internally that we had a real problem on our hands here. We'd known for quite some time about Envis, but it, it didn't become clear enough to actually, I think, pop a flare and go back to Intel and security and say, clearly, we're not going to meet that milestone. Um, so all I'm saying is, sir, both of these problems are, were quite bad for what they one, opus for what it could have been, because as you've said, we did recover the 90 terabytes of data, thankfully. That was a failure to follow internal controls, meaning that we had an employee, some employees together that did not follow the proper procedures for the ways in which we would clear um, storage memory on the system and instead issued an order that wiped out 90 terabytes of data. 
Now, again, it's great. We have mag magnetic tapes that have the backup on it. But the root cause of that is a failure of accountability, a failure to follow proper procedure. Concurrently, we had longstanding problems related to Envis. Well, what, but well, let, me, let me go to this is where I think we're, Senator Kelly and I were both trying to hit a little bit on. I was informed or told that, you know, the net, the, going back to the fixed price contract, the nature of the contract, there was no incentive for the contractor to say, oh, by the way, we're meeting you, we believe we are contractually meeting your requirement, but by the way, we could never scale this to meet the full needs of the, of the community. Senator, I'd say- Is that of, fair or not fair? I'm not sure it's entirely fair, but it's not unfair. I think, I think what I would say in response is, the contractor doesn't get paid unless the software they develop meets the specification and is successful. So in that regard, the government gets what it pays for. The government gets what it tells the contractor it needs to do. However, it is not the contractor's primary responsibility to inform the government that it might not scale or it might not be able to be aggregated as the government performs the role of the software integrator. But, but you could ask the question of whether it's incumbent upon the contractor to inform the government, hey, government, your ideas don't make sense. Right. Well, that wouldn't, you know, especially if DCSA didn't write the specs. But isn't there some obligation, moral or otherwise, maybe not legal, but moral or otherwise, to say, hey, we're building, we're building a machine that's not going to be able to service the scope of the problem that we're trying to address? Well, Senator, I can't comment too much on that piece of it in the past, but just to say that, again, as we review the procurement approach and the ways in which we will move forward, these are all key factors. And the company's got a good reputation. Let me, let me state that. The company's, the, the contractor's got a good reputation, but I just, this where I, I, I remember as a new um, senator having a lot of contractor base in, in Virginia, um, in the beginning of the Obama administration, I thought, I'm going to figure out defense contracting. And the then number two at DOD came over and brought four contracting officers in 12 volumes. And I was cured of my uh, thought that I was going to fix this um, uh, in any, any shape or form. But at least in terms of what we've got ability to say purview over, and this is one of those areas where you know, we're going to stay obsessed about this until at least as long as I'm here. You know, is there legislative authority, and maybe doc, this is for not just Secretary Harrison and Director Cattler, but Dr. Plum, Dr. Dixon, you know, either in terms of a stick of a penalty that if you don't inform, or an incentive if you do, oh, by the way, we'll, we'll give you a little extra spliff here if you, you know, if you tell us, government, that we are completely screwed up on our requirements or we're not building something that's going to meet the problem. Senator, that's just not the way we built that contract architecture. That's not to say we couldn't in the future or that we shouldn't, but we did not. Right, but it's, but, and again, this is not just a, a, your problem that is across as we all cite our various examples, but it is a little frustrating that when we see, and, and it's not like every large corporate software problem, project doesn't have problems, but we do seem to have an extraordinarily higher failure rate on big software projects in government than almost anything else. And Dr. Plummer, looked like you were going to hit your button. I was just, um, I was going to add, Senator, I think, you know, a big part of the issue uh, that, that the, our defense digital service team identified that we're working closely with TCSA is making sure the right technical talent exists inside the government to vet and review what's going on. In this case, just as an example, the decision was made on this contract in 2018 to have essentially a low code solution, which means it's um, it's like a sort of simple drag and dot, drop coding solution to, uh, to solve a massive data architecture engineering problem, including with some legacy systems that are, uh, that use code that doesn't exist anymore, that people don't use anymore. Um, that's not traditionally, we would not consider that a best practice. Um, we wouldn't even consider that an advisable practice because you want a true programming language, a Java or a SQL, to be able to manage the interaction between those databases in a, a flexible and continuous development way. So as a, just a concrete example, the lack of technical expertise 
in the government to review those types of decision, the, tech, the decisions to how to meet the requirements, which, which as were mentioned, I think were clear, how to translate that into a technical solution was missing. I think what we have now is a team of technical experts with our defense digital services that are working hand in glove with the program management office and are working with that office to identify and hire inherent technical talent that will but, help But does that, that, let's take it out of DCSA, let's take another part of the government, another part of DOD, you know, are we gonna bring your SWAT team in on the front end before we put these contracts out in other area? I mean, just. Well, that's what we're trying, I mean, yes, we're trying to do that um, uh, for future solutions. I think better to solve it on the front end of the procurement than the back end. Uh, and I think there are broader efforts to do this across the, the department that don't, that have technical talent in but, them that but, don't but need what, us. What you guys are doing in, in your, um, Defense Digital Services. I mean, how long has that enterprise been around? Uh, I think I, I, I could get the exact answer, but I think since roughly about 2017 or 2018. Okay, so it has been. I mean, so Probably. I keep thinking about like under Obama administration, there was 18F and there was the right. digital services. Exactly. It feels like these kind of crack SWAT teams, they come and go inside the government enterprise in a way that we don't build that at least review part of the process in, in enough of our systems, is that fair? Uh, that probably is fair. I think inside of the Department of Defense, we've tried to establish this chief digital and AI office, my office, as the uh, lead staff assistant inside the department to oversee that uh, data, data architecture, data oversight, data principles, to help drive alignment both in how we build the technical requirements we're talking about and what the procurement requirements are. So what does it mean to be interoperable? What does it mean for the government to have data rights? Um, so that that's baked into the contracts the government writes instead of trying to solve that problem over and over again. And that's work we have ongoing and we have sort of large scale initiatives underway to do that. Dr. Kettler is, you know, and you mentioned the fact that, you know, maybe your predecessors weren't aware or ask for too much power and authority um, without enough oversight or didn't recognize um, they didn't have the technology components. Is there a way to build in somebody with, you know, you got an agency with 5,400 people. Somebody's got to have been willing to say, hey, you know, we're biting off more than we can chew or, or are there any things, again, with your agency and specifically, but is there other ways to build in some kind of incentive within the agency to say, before we bite this, we got to think twice or? Well, yes, sir. And, and I think that's, these are some of the issues I'm alluding to when I talk about having a culture of accountability. We also needed to look hard inside ourselves as well and determine were we organized the proper way broadly, but on specifically on these issues, to be the right people in the right places and have we segregated the decision authority in a way that'll give us first internal checks and balances and also um, some different expertise and some differences of view as we take these decisions. So I've already mentioned we lacked a firm understanding of the complexity of technical features required to deliver. We underestimated the timelines it would take. Now, those are both about expertise. We had a shortage of critical technical agile acquisition and integration skills within the program when the program was transferred to us, but then also over time within DCSA. When I talk about leadership, um, I think it's important to point out I also hired another program, a new program executive officer. The role of the program executive officer here is to look across, in my agency, nine programs, Envis is but one of them, to make sure that they're compliant with proper acquisition strategies and the documentation is robust is also compliant. Well, why, why were we able to set up DCSA without having a program executive in place as part of the initial structure of the agency? Well, Senator, in this case, we had the two billets, but for a period of time, the ENVIS program manager and the program executive officer were in fact the same individual person, which is why I'm saying the decision authority was a bit too concentrated. It's been a while since I've been in business, but I realized that's, that's <laughs> You're supposed to have these, these functions check each other or somebody overseeing the actual program management itself at a somewhat of a checkpoint level. Senator, I completely agree. And again, if I'm not in a position to record properly diagnostic and accurate internal information, nor report it 
up to my higher headquarters where I'm held accountable, then it's easy to see where you'll have a breakdown uh, in process that can over time lead to these sorts of problems that we're experiencing with Envis. And that's why, again, I say this 90-day period that the acting undersecretary called for, this 90-day review, has been critical and really fruitful, well-timed, because she did bring in new leadership at the agency level, by extension then brought in a new PEO and a new program manager. We're able to look comprehensively with partners from CDAO, DDS, counted on GAO here also to go back through those reports. We invited them in. They came in to see me at my invitation the first week of May. Uh, it was just critically important that we brought the right people to the table. Well, I would ask again if there are additional legislative authorities, but I do think, you know, and, and maybe we are not being harsh enough. I mean, this, uh, and it's a strange time in lots of government at this point, but, you know, to me in many ways, uh, you know, this is in a different setting with maybe a different membership here that was more willing to just kind of flog the heck out of you guys. This is as, as you know, holy heck, government abuse contract problem as, as you know, pretty much anything I've, you know, I've seen. You know, you could make a lot of, of hay with how this started, new agency, we're five years behind, we didn't get fully notified, you know, they didn't, your, your predecessor, Secretary Harris, wasn't even fully notified in, in an appropriate way, and we're, we are, you know, what was supposed to be probably wrong sized at 700 million to start, but we're, you know, roughly, you know, 1.7 billion now, five years late, with another 18 months and no cost estimate to go. If we weren't, you know, I'm, I'm glad we got the new team here because if it was the old team, it would just be too easy not to just whack the heck out of you guys. But the next time you come, you know, if we're not seeing market improvement, and you just need to be straight with us. If it's, uh, I, I do think you know, this is broader than your, your respective roles, but the incentives to get the contractor to raise their hand that say, hey, we're not building something that can scale or we're not building something that's gonna really meet the need. Or within the agency, there's gotta be somebody that kind of felt this doesn't pass the smell test. And I obviously think, you know, and I remember when your predecessors came in and said, all right, we're gonna bring it up into big DOD and bring more of the expertise. How we let it get this far along the way um, is a real challenge. Because if we go back to where we start, uh, and Dr. Dickinson, you're not gonna get away completely unscathed here. Um, where was the pack through all of this? Uh, Senator Warner, thank you for that. I you're absolutely right. We did not recognize that there was an issue. Um, we talked about INBIS at every time we met as PAC principals, which was very frequent. But we were also working across the, all the other things that we're trying to deliver as part of Trusted Workforce 2.0. So we did not dedicate enough time diving in and asking the hard questions. I think we all made assumptions that some of these other levels of oversight actually existed when it turns out that they did not. But we did not ask the questions that would have gotten us to realize that there was a problem earlier. But again, but well, hold it. That's not, that doesn't put, totally pass the smell test either because, you know, we know this, knew this was a problem that was supposed to be delivered in 2019. Didn't somebody say in 2022 or 2020? Now, again, you could argue we've asked that question too, but you had a more direct ongoing responsibility. Why didn't somebody in the pack say, we got to dig into this a little more? I think when, when the group of us that, the, the former people that were at the table with me back in March of 23, all of us came in in 21. And so we actually thought that we were on track for the redo, redo the, and the new process and the new plan for INBIS. And every time we looked at the slides, there was not so many tremendous changes in the deliverables to raise the concern to us. It looked like there were minimal slips. So when you came in in 21, they were still expecting a, 20, a September of 24 Correct. deliverable? Correct. I, I, I don't remember the exact date, but it was it was definitely something in the future beyond 21. But, but did you have in September, when you came in in 21, did you have a plan that says, okay, by September of 24, we're gonna get it done and it's gonna cost X? You must have had some presumption of what the costs were gonna be. I, I'm, well, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that we did as PAC principles. We sort of were all looking at our own particular pieces of the puzzle. And so I don't know that we were. Well, how do we make sure the PAC doesn't miss this again? Oh. Or, 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 you know, because again, Embus is just one piece 
of this glorified idea. I mean, I, you know, I, I had a lot of problems with the, you know, the previous administration, but the previous administration did at least start to take on this and help work to bring down the, you know, the backlog. But I feel like we, you know, we knock out one of these issues. We knocked out the backlog, then we had to deal with the adjudication piece. And, you know, and again, I'm talking, preaching to the choir here when we, you know, didn't have enough you know, polygraph right. trainers, then we didn't have enough people to train the polygraphers. You know, I think we keep knocking these things down, but then you get this, we got this glorified great new system, and this is an embarrassment. I, I agree. I am. What I can say is I am much more comfortable now with the level of oversight that's going to be provided with Dr. Plum, with uh, acquisition and sustainment, as well as with what the Honorable Harris and her staff are going to do. This is what should have been in place beforehand. Now that it is in place, we will well, do are there, One of the things we're going to ask the packer, how many other of these potential, you know, ticking time bombs or not ticking time bombs, you know, uh, potential, oh my gosh, we're not going to hit these metrics, very little of what is left to be delivered is, is IT solutions. Uh, most of what's left to be delivered include how do you take the, the guidelines and the standards we've, process, we've created and then roll them out into the workforce? How do you get everyone ready to do the types of investigations? And so a lot of things are dependent on INVIS, but INVIS is by far the largest IT part of Trusted Workforce 2.0. Oh, well, I would, would say this, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, Great respect for you. I also had great respect for your predecessor, Sue Gordon. She promised me she was not going to leave the job until we had reciprocity with CIA. We are making a great deal of progress on reciprocity. I think when across you, the whole community, across the community, when you talk about specifically someone that's going from a civil, similar level of security classification or security clearance needed, that person, as I mentioned before, that process can take as little as five days when it is apples to apples. In many cases, though, it's not. You're going from an agency where the responsibilities you have in one job are actually less and require less sensitive information than the other one. And so then you have to look at, okay, does the person need, do we have to go back and look at those, the, the continuing vet, continuous vetting alerts? Did something come in between the time the person was hired in the one agency or the other one? Does this one agency, the second agency now require medical screening or psychological screening or a different kind of polygraph? So there are other things that make it not a simple movement but when it is exactly the same level of clearance, same responsibilities and same process from one agency to another, that process is very quick. And we are working on the other one. Okay. And is there any way as well that I can hold our former staff director, Mike Casey, responsible for anything screwing up going forward? Mike Casey and his organization are going to deliver a tool that's going to significantly help with reciprocity. And I'm absolutely sure that they are uh, listening. On what timeline? No, he's, he's looked to your left. Um, <clears throat> We are in the requirements definition stage, and we may actually uh, reach out to Requirements Dr. definition Plum. stage, we may need Dr. Plum's or a team. Exactly. Exactly. I think we'll, we have some oversight that we're already talking about, and how do we make sure that we... Honorable Casey it. does not want to be up here in front of this panel talking about this issue at some point in the future. I would. I am absolutely sure you, you would agree with that statement. Well, um, you know, I, I, I'm disappointed where we're, that we're here. I, I do appreciate... Um, you know, the new members of the team who are trying to get this, but we're gonna, we have to stay on it. You know, end of the day, we get caught up on these details, but end of the day, we gotta make sure we've got a security clearance process that works, that we can still recruit the best and the brightest into the community, that our government contracting workforce can not be delayed and, you know, uh, driven to not be as efficient because they, they have to waste so much time. And, you know, we didn't even get today to the, um, the whole question of, you know, smaller companies who don't even have billets based upon butts in the seat so that you, you know, your CFO, you make it the CEO as a clearance, but the CFO doesn't know. And how do you have a CFO that doesn't even know what the projects that are working on? We are actually making progress on that too. We heard you loud and clear that there are individuals who, who can't charge to a contract who need to have clearances. Right, who need to have, you, their senior executive team has to have those billets or have to have those numbers. We're trying to work with our contracting organizations but to actually make I sure know, that can but, happen. But respectfully, uh, and I know you've only been saying it for two and a half years, but I've had other people sat in that sit in this seat now for the seven or eight years, not almost ten years that I'm going to talk about it. And I, you know, I just don't understand why it's taken so darn long and why some of this is so hard. And maybe that will be the, the, the function of our our next hearing. For those of you at DCSA and Inbus, uh, we've got. Great expectations, um, but I strongly, strongly suggest that you, if you've got a need for different authorities, 
I'd like to hear, Dr. Plum, I know you, we say this is not the way we structure um, software and government contracting, but maybe we ought to take some experiments. You know, we can call it AI. That means we can get funding for it no matter what if we call it AI in your office. And, you know, but think about where we actually try to align the agency and the contractor's interest to kind of come to the same you know, technology-driven success goal, which I think, again, and I don't think this is unique to NBIS, but is too often a problem where they are not aligned. Um, you know, uh, uh, I think I've driven all my other colleagues away for hours. I, I, I was actually surprised we got as many showing up as we did. Uh, um, but as long as I'm here, we're going to stay on this and we're going to get it fixed. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>